Well, thank you, Andrew, for that very warm welcome. I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and thanks to the organisers for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, I think it is highly appropriate that this talk is taking place in this particular venue, um, because my talk is about youth crime. And this was the scene of many of my own youthful misdemeanours. When I was a student at Edinburgh, more decades ago than I care to remember, I stayed at Pollock Halls. And then, good afternoon, Pollock Halls. I know this is being streamed live to you. And I was in Lee House, which is the best house. When I arrived as an ingenue, an innocent from Glasgow, uh, my very first day, I opened the door into Lee House. And there was this enormous poster. And it said, an evening of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I thought, I have come to the right university. Well, the musicians amongst you will know that this evening of sex, drugs and rock and roll was not a forerunner in the 1970s of Innovative Learning Week, but it was actually a concert by Ian Dury. But I do believe that having a history of youthful misdemeanours is ex was excellent preparation for my subsequent career as a professor of penology. I think if you have been a criminal yourself, actually it gives you better insight into crime. And I also think it's rather a good preparation for being head of a law school, although the vice principals might not think that. Okay. Well, I want you to concentrate on this image on this slide here, this image, the image of the faceless youth here. Now, this is an image of someone that David Cameron, the UK Prime Minister, once described as a hoodie. And he also talked about hugging a hoodie. And that's why Andrew and I hugged when he came up on the stage. Here he's wearing his hoodie. And that, for me, was a very symbolic gesture, hugging a hoodie. And I think David Cameron could do to hug a little bit more. This image of this faceless youth is someone that the tabloid press refer to more viscerally as some, sometimes a thug, sometimes a yob, sometimes a yobo, sometimes a feral youth. Um, and in Scotland, and in my native Glaswegian, we refer to this person as a Ned. Now, my aim this afternoon is to transform the way in which you think about the person behind that image. I want to convince you that criminal justice responses, and in particular, punitive and vengeful responses, don't work. They do not work. And in fact, they make the problem worse. If we truly wish to build an inclusive and respectful society, one in which all people and all communities live in safety and security, then we must adopt a compassionate approach to the problems posed by serious and persistent offenders. An approach which looks beyond that faceless image to the vulnerable child within. And an approach which recognizes that to be tough on crime requires social justice and not criminal justice responses. Now, I've got two sets of evidence that I want to draw on to build my argument. First set of evidence comes from the Edinburgh study of youth transitions and crime. This is a study which I've been conducting with my com compatriot in crime, Susan McVie, for, since 1998. We've been tracking the lives of around 4,300 young people in Edinburgh. So that's the first set of evidence I want to bring to your attention. The second is going to be a small natural experiment that we're going to conduct in the hall today. Now, TED is meant to be a transformative experience, not only for speakers, but also for the audience. And so I'm going to transform your lives by making you into my research subjects for an afternoon. So I hope you're going to enjoy this. Now, I've got quite a lot to get through in the period of around about 10 minutes. There's a lot of findings I want to show you and share with you. Um, and I'm going to have to go quite fast. So this is going to be a 100-meter sprint through the findings, but not, Vice Principal, I assure you on this occasion, on any performance-enhancing drugs. So <laughs> off we go. Right. Why is punishment an inappropriate response to youth crime? Well, as indicated on this slide here, um, our findings indicate that punishment is disproportionate, it's ineffective, and it is unethical. So, in the spirit of showing you the disproportionate aspect of it, um, I want to conduct my small natural experiment. So, I want everyone in the room here who has ever committed a crime to put their hands up. 
Now, you're going to have to trust me on this one because I'm a, a professor of penology. I'm also head of the law school, and I can assure you that nothing will happen if you put your hands up. So I notice now I've got probably about half of the room have got their hands up in the air. Okay, so for the remainder of you who've got your hands down, how many of you ever drank alcohol under the age of 18? Oh, a few more going up. <laughs> I don't believe you. How many of you ever bought alcohol under the age of 18? Now, keep your hands up if you're a criminal. I want the hands up all the time. Okay, so who, who ever drove over the speed limit? Come on, hands up. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. So I've already got about three quarters of the room now that are admitting that they are an offender. Can I assure everybody with their hands up in the air that you are completely normal and the rest of you are lying? Because... <laughs> You put your hands down now. Because what we've found from our study is that crime in the teenage years is completely normal. It is completely normal. Rule-breaking is a normal phase in development, in adolescent development. And as you can see here on this slide, I've got a graph of our, our cohort. You can see that offending peaks around about age 15, when 70% of the cohort admitted at least one of the offences that we had in our questionnaire. Um, and it then declines steeply after that, stopping by around about age 24. So it's normal. And mostly, it's very petty in nature. Most of the crimes that young people, and most of the crimes probably the people in this room have committed, are fairly petty, things like minor forms of graffiti, uh, minor forms of breach of the peace. The most serious sorts of crimes, such as assault or robbery, are only committed by a very tiny proportion of young people. So that's the first reason why punitive responses to crime are actually inappropriate. Offending is normal, it's mostly petty, and it stops. The second reason why crime and punishment, punishment for crime, is an inappropriate response is because the criminal justice system doesn't stop crime. Only a very tiny proportion of the crimes committed by people are ever caught, they're ever caught by the police, ever caught, ever processed by the criminal justice system. And for those that do come to the attention of the system, we have strong evidence that actually it makes the likelihood of further convictions more likely, not less likely, that actually the criminal justice system makes the people it catches much worse. Okay, so let's go back to our natural experiment. Can I have everybody in the audience who um, was a self-confessed criminal to put your hands up again, please? Okay, so I've got all my criminals here. Right, now, listen to this instruction very carefully. The very first time you committed this offence, and I'm assuming you probably are not a persistent offender, but the very first time you committed it, were you caught by the police? And if you were caught by the police, put your hand down. So if you're caught, put your hand down. And hardly anybody, if you look around the room, has actually put their hands down. Thank you very much. That's the experiment ended. What that shows you is that the vast majority of crime is unknown to the criminal justice system. And that's exactly what our findings have found. If you can see here on this slide, 69% of our most serious and persistent offenders were never known to agencies of juvenile justice, and 84% of them never had a conviction in the criminal justice system up to age 18. They were completely under the radar. So the criminal justice system is ineffective to the extent it doesn't know about the vast amount of crime that goes on. But the second reason why the um, criminal justice system is ineffective is because it increases the likelihood of further convictions for the young people who get caught up in it. I think this is one of our most shocking findings. As you can see here, there's an example of this, that those who were imprisoned by age 18, a whopping 80% of them went on to have a further conviction, and 70% of them ended up back in prison by the age of 22. So what we have is a criminal justice system that is just recycling the usual suspects. It's recycling the usual suspects. The reasons why many of you who said they had committed crime were not ever caught is because you don't fit the profile. You don't fit the profile of the usual suspect that gets recycled in the system. Now, if we were true to scientific principles, scientific principles, and based our criminal justice system on the evidence alone, 
we would actually abolish it. We would get rid of it. Um, it's the equivalent of trying to cure somebody who's got acne with a sledgehammer, trying to bash the patient over the head with a sledgehammer. What happens? You get rid of the spots, you kill the patient. In. Now, it's a very expensive sledgehammer too. It costs roughly, estimates vary, but it's between 75,000 and 135,000 pounds a year to keep one child in a secure unit or in a young offenders institution. Now that is hugely expensive. If this was any other area of public policy, it would be a national scandal that taxpayers' money was being spent on something that was so ineffective, something that has an 80% failure rate. So why? Why do we do this? Why is it that these sorts of inefficiencies are tolerated? Well, the reason why they're in tolerated is because of victims of crime, and this is really important. The counter-argument always leveled um, at people who try to argue for radical reform is, what about victims of crime? Surely some criminal justice response is needed to offer some form of retribution or recognition of the harm and suffering that they have been caused. And that is really, really important. But interestingly, research which has been done on victims' views and victims' understanding of what should happen to offenders have generally found something slightly different. What they find is that victims of crime don't want other people to suffer in the same way that they have. That's what they want. What they value are effective rather than vengeful responses. That's really important. But even more importantly, when we talk about victims and offenders, we generally assume that they are somehow two separate groups, with the victims being more morally deserving than the offenders. But what we know from our study findings and from other research is that victims and offenders are actually an overlapping group and that serious and persistent offenders are amongst the most victimized and vulnerable group of young people in our society as a whole. And that is the key reason why I think punitive and vengeful responses to crime are inherently unethical. And I've got some data to support this here on this slide. Now, what I've done is I've carved the cohort, and actually, when I think about it, carving is possibly the wrong metaphor here, given it's about violence and self-harm. But anyway, I've carved the cohort up into three different groups, and they go from left to right, non-offenders, non-violent offenders, and violent offenders. And as you can see in all four of my graphs there, offenders are far more vulnerable than non-offenders, and violent offenders are the most vulnerable group in the cohort as a whole. So as you can see, violent offenders suffer much the most uh, crime victimization of any group within the cohort, that offenders are victims, that they are significantly more likely to be bullied than other groups within the cohort, and there is a very natural interaction, an interesting interaction, between being a bully, because many of them were bullies, and being bullied. So being a bully often means that you're very bullied. Their vulnerability is underscored by the high levels of self-harm amongst the violent offender group, particularly amongst the young girls, young women in that violent offender group. Um, cutting was the most common form of self-harm amongst this group. Um, other things that were reported were things like tearing out hair, punching yourself, and in some cases, sticking needles into your eyes. And this vulnerability is again underscored by the high level of parasuicidal behavior amongst this particular group. Now, parasuicidal behavior was not common amongst our cohort. Only around about 5% of the cohort ever admitted that they had tried, made a serious attempt to kill themselves at any point. Um, but this was much more common amongst the violent offender group. And things that they did were things like attempted to slit their wrists, take overdoses, or attempts to hang themselves. So, the offenders are victims. They are a very vulnerable group. A second reason why um, punitive responses to youth crime are inherently unethical is that we know from Edinburgh study findings that the criminal justice system disproportionately punishes the most poor and the most excluded groups. 
And as you can see here, um, the youngsters who'd been put into detention, that is the darker of the bars there, they were disproportionately more likely to come from low socioeconomic families, status families, the poorest families, and they were disproportionately likely to have been excluded from school at some point. Indeed, and this is really interesting, the best predictor of whether someone ended up in prison by age 24 was not involvement in serious offending. Now, you might expect it would be serious offending, but it is not. It is as if they were, they were excluded from school by the age of 12. So school exclusion is the strongest predictor of ending up in prison. And the best predictor of whether a young person was excluded from school at an early age was not actually involvement in bad behaviour per se, but rather where they, whether they came from a deprived neighbourhood. We have strong evidence that equally badly behaved youngsters who come from much more affluent families and much more affluent communities, that their behaviour is tolerated to a greater extent than that of youngsters from more deprived backgrounds. School exclusion is not a neutral process, and I think that is a truly shocking finding. So, here's my faceless youth again. If we know from the research evidence that the criminal justice system is totally ineffective, if we know that offenders are highly vulnerable, highly vulnerable, highly victimized, if we know that school exclusion has such devastating effects, and if we know that victims value effective rather than vengeful responses, then what should we do? What should we do instead? Well, this is what we should do. We need a social justice model, a social justice model. And for this, this for most jurisdictions would mean dismantling most of what we know is the criminal justice system and saturating deprived communities instead with services and support. But to do this would require both compassion and moral courage and leadership from our politicians, from our policy makers and from our practitioners. The first thing, the starting point for this model of change would be to try to maximise diversion from formal measures wherever possible, sending youngsters off to other things than sucking them in to the criminal justice system. And I have to say that Scotland provides a very good model for this. It's actually something that the world should come to Scotland and look at what we do in terms of maximising diversion. It is really excellent practice. But the second thing we need to do is for the very tiny number of youngsters who are dangerous, who are a danger to themselves or a danger to others, what we need to do is provide small-scale units which are set up to deal with their complex needs and they're based on welfare rather than punishment. We should abolish young offender institutions. But we need to go much further than this. And uh, here I've outlined five key steps to change. These are the five key steps that we need to take to transform the way we deal with youth crime. Firstly, there's a need to create community schools. Community schools who can form the fulcrum of a regenerated community. A community school is somewhere where children learn, where the community learns. It can be a focus of services and support within that community. And these community schools need to do something more imaginative with the young people who exhibit the most challenging behaviour. We need to have more innovative and challenging ways of dealing with challenging behaviour to retain these youngsters in mainstream education. If we did that alone, doing that alone would reduce imprisonment rates amongst young people by around two-thirds. That one thing alone. Community schools are one thing. We also need in these communities better health care, better housing, basic things, better support for parents. And this all has to be done in the context of meaningful economic opportunity. I want to end this presentation by asking you, the audience, and you, my fellow criminals, <laughs> two key questions. Do you have the compassion to look beyond that faceless youth to the vulnerable child within? Do you have the moral courage to campaign with me for those five steps to change?
But if we truly wish to build an inclusive society, a respectful society, a society in which all our children, all our young people, all our diverse communities can live in safety and security, then this is the model with, with which we need to start. Thank you very much.